She first came into our lives as a woman named Jackie, and then she touched our hearts and touched by an angel, and for children, little angels. But it was with her husband, Mark Burnett, that she produced one of the most successful TV miniseries of all time, The Bible, and its spin-off film, Son of God. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with producer, actress, and author, Roma Downey. together the body of your work, what would that tell us about you? But I have a funny feeling we can figure that out. <laughs> Touched by an angel, little angels, the Bible, Son of God. I think that there's a theme here. <laughs> yeah, a resonating theme. I love God and I have tried to glorify Him in my work. And you know, honestly, when you get to combine what you love to do with what you believe, it's really, what a blessing, a blessing for me to be able to. Has your faith always been this strong? Um, I grew up in a house where the faith was really up front and center, and um, though it was tested when I was just a little girl because my mother died, and um, she was my sun and my moon and my stars, and she was just a young woman in her late 40s, and she unexpectedly dropped dead of a heart attack, and it was as if the lights had been switched out. And I honestly know if it hadn't been for my faith and the promise that I would see her again, I don't know how I would have gotten through yeah. those years in adolescence. As a 10-year-old, though, do you understand what's going on? How much did you grasp how your world was changing at that moment? Oh, well, you know, it, very literally my world changed because I went from being a child who came home into a warm home filled with laughter with a a warm fire burning in the hearth to a child that was a latchkey kid and had to get the key from the wee woman who lived next door, Josie McGeady, would let me into the house and, and the house was dark and there was no fire. I mean, it, it would literally, it, it, the experience um, was night and day. My father was a, was a great dad, and, um, but he had to work. And as I understand also, art was a big part of your early life. How did that play out from that point in your life? The experience of what happened with your mother into expressing yourself through art, was there a co connection there? Yeah, I think that, you know, um, I have always felt um, uh, that I had an artistic um, way of expressing myself. I, I was very good at, um, at drawing mm -hmm. and at painting, and, um, and I had a flair for that. Um, I also had a flair for performing and you know, enjoyed the school plays, and and um, you know, I think I always imagined somehow that I had a a soundtrack uh, playing in my head, and that um, it helped me deal with my life. You know, there was there was this sense of abandonment in my life because my mom had died, and then I also was growing up in the troubles. You know, I grew up during the war in Northern Ireland, and it wasn't your typical childhood because there were you know, there was shooting in the streets and we would have to duck down behind cars on our way home from school and, and there were explosions in the town and, you know, my very first job when I was 16, I got a job in a shoe shop as a Saturday sales girl and, um, and I remember one day they came in with, with balaclavas, you know, with the ski masks and said, you just have 10 minutes to get out and, uh, and it was pouring with rain and we all went and got our coats, which seems insane, <laughs> but we got our coats and we bundled up and we all went out into the car park and we weren't in the car park five minutes. Then the whole shop blew up and it was raining shoes, you know, so there was very real danger and real threat and fear. And so I think that as a way to cope, you know, my artistic life um, provided me uh, an escape into my love of art, my, uh, my desire to paint pictures, to make pictures that were not the life I was living, or to imagine a life other than the life I was living. And so when it came time to go to university, it was at my father's encouragement that I spread my wings 
and that I fly, that I would leave. He said, your education will be your passport out. And, you know, I love Ireland and I have loved um, Derry, my hometown. But at that time, I was very glad to leave. Does that challenge your faith in God, though? When all of that is going on, where do you find the strength to say, God is good, God is something that I believe in and he's watching out for us when you see this negative? How does that balance out? For well, you? I think that for me, you know, I just always felt that God was with me. When I was very young, somebody shared with me that beautiful footprints prayer, mm -hmm. which I have loved and I've kept with me um, forever. And the, the idea that in those moments in your life, when you feel alone, when you feel abandoned, um, you know, I'm sure you know the prayer, but the person is saying, you know, I look at the footprints of the journey of my life, and in those times when I needed you the most, there's only one set of footprints. Where were you when I needed you? And uh, Jesus says, those were the moments I was carrying you. Yeah. You know, that's why there's only one set I was carrying you, and I, I certainly felt that. You know, I, uh, while I felt alone, I never felt alone. I had such a, um, a strong connection to, and a, I felt a support from, from my faith that carried me through, you know. So I'll be forever grateful for that, and grateful to my father for nurturing, uh, you know, for, for making faith important in our family, for making prayer important in our family. You know, some of my fondest family memories were gathered together with him praying of an evening, mm -hmm. you know, and that became an important part of my life. And when those, when those things are anchored in your early life, I think that you create patterns, right, that you create a practice mm -hmm. in your life. And so I was a very young girl when I developed a prayer practice. And, you know, it's the same prayer practice that I have walked into my adult life with that has continued to support me and in the work that I'm doing. So then it seems an odd choice from where I sit that you would go into acting mm -hmm. because they seem like such different worlds, but you found a way to merge them together. Yeah, I don't see, it's like a natural expression of, you know, if, if the artist's job is to communicate um, the human experience in some ways, um, you know, I, you know, I really love that. I, I came up through the theater um, my first love was the stage. Uh, I um, have a classical theatre training, um, performing the works of Shakespeare and Shaw and Chekhov and so on. And um, I trained in London and then eventually uh, went back and worked with the Abbey Theatre, which is the National Theatre Company of Ireland. And it was with the production of the Playboy of the Western World uh, that, uh, that we brought a, a show to tour the United States to come to cities that had a Irish uh, connection, Chicago, yeah. Boston, Philadelphia, and so on, and was my first real introduction to America. But you know, if you consider that an actor really is someone who pretends to be somebody else, you know, um, professional <laughs> pretenders, <laughs> um, you know, I don't know that it's such a leap if I was experiencing, you know, unhappiness that I would want to pretend to be somebody else. I'm going to take you into now the, the fun stuff. Here's some fun questions for you. So you were turned down for an Irish Spring commercial because you sounded, you didn't sound Irish enough. Yes, I know. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Back in the day when I first moved to New York, I, um, and I got an agent and I, uh, he sent me out for an Irish Spring soap commercial and I thought, oh yeah, I I've, got got, this one. I've got this one. <laughs> And I was in the waiting room with these, you know, gorgeous girls, but they were, you know, American girls. And, um, and I went in and I had to read the copy. And as I recall, the copy was simply, somebody said, you know, Ma Irish Spring Soap. And the guy says, manly, yeah, you know, manly, yes. And, and I had to say, and I like, I like it, it too. too. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it was a great campaign. And the guy kept saying to me, could you sound more could you sound a bit more Irish? And, you know, and I think what he meant, could I sound a little bit more Hollywood Irish, you know? And uh, anyway, or a little bit more leprechaun. I wasn't <laughs> quite sure what it was he wanted, but I got back home certain that, you know, it was just a matter of figuring out when I would shoot it and where. And uh, my agent said, now are you sitting down? You know, you, uh, you didn't get this, so you didn't get this role. So, 
it was their loss. I, um, uh, it, very, very funny. But my first job before I started getting acting work in New York, I eventually got a show on Broadway, which was a dream yeah. come true. But my very first job was as a coat check girl. It's the next thing I was going to ask yeah. you about. In an Upper West Side uh, restaurant, a very swanky restaurant that I could have only dreamed about affording to eat in. Yeah. You know, it was expensive. And, uh, and everybody would arrive in at 7 or 7.30 and I would hang up their coats and then, and then I'd sit there in my little cubicle window looking out, imagining what it would be like to be those people living those lives. And, um, and the very first celebrity that I ever met was Regis Philbin. <laughs> and I checked his coat and when he came to get his coat back at the end of the evening, didn't he give me $20? And I maybe got a quarter or a dollar if I was lucky, a tip. And he gave me $20, and I thought he was the most generous, <laughs> lovely man, and I never forgot his kindness. And then it was maybe five or six years later, um, and my, my journey had taken me from New York and the theater to Los Angeles. I had been cast as Jackie Kennedy right. in a miniseries about her life, and I had moved to LA, and I was now starring on Touch by an Angel, and wasn't I invited back to New York to be the guest star on the Regis well, Philbin Regis show? And, Kathy Lee. and I told that story to him, and he said, "Oh, this is very bad." He said, "He said either you're telling the story because I stiffed you, <laughs> or, or I give you a good tip." And I said, "Well, I wouldn't come your own on your own show and tell a bad story <laughs> about you. <laughs> you give me a good tip, but but amazing, you know, that yeah. you can be checking coats one day." and dreaming about eating in the restaurant and then eating in the restaurant yourself, you know, a few Is years Is it later. hard to remember that world for yourself? Because once you have the success that you've had and the life that you've had, is it hard to stay in touch with that person? Is it something you have to actively do or is that a fallacy the way we look at it? Well, uh, you know, I think that you're, you know, everybody's life changes. I mean, if you look at your own life 25 years ago, you know, <laughs> are you the same man that you were? And, 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 you know, chances are not. And that's a good thing, right? We should be changing and evolving in our life's experiences. Shape us like water on a stone. After a woman named Jackie, then you seem to have a choice of two roles. You could either take Touch by an Angel or Xena Warrior Princess. <laughs> is that true? You know, it is true. Yeah, yeah. I know as crazy as that sounds, I had gone down, I had played Jackie and it was a, a wonderful break for me coming out of the theater system. And I worked with a guy who we nicknamed the Brogue Basher. Um, <laughs> and every time he would hear an Irishism in my accent, he'd hit me over the head with a script um, to sound like, like, uh, like Jackie. And uh, that miniseries, A Woman Named Jackie, went on to win uh, the Emmy for Best Miniseries that year which was fantastic, and I moved to, to Los Angeles on the heels of that. And, uh, and one of the jobs that came in for me, uh, did I, was I interested in going to New Zealand to play the, the Queen of the Amazons? <laughs> And I took it. I, no, I, right. I said, are you sure they want me to play the Queen of the Amazons? Because I'm only five foot four. And uh, they said, no, no, they, they do. And, you know, here's lesson number one. Do not take a job just because you're interested in the location. Um, you know, it wasn't a bad job. And, right. you know, the, the, that, that series <laughs> went on one. to be, it was great fun, really, yeah. to be honest with you. I was down there in, Austra in New Zealand, the most beautiful country. But while I was uh, down there filming, they asked, would I be interested in staying and continuing on in this sort of warrior mode? Um, I spent most of my, my time standing on, on a box, I have to add, <laughs> so that I looked tall like everybody else. And, um, and I said, you know, as, as fun as this is down here in my armor uh, in New Zealand, I don't know that this is what I want to be doing yeah. with my life. And um, and when I came back to the States, Touched by an Angel was waiting for me. Boy, how different your career path would have been. Yes, I know. Taking I know. the other. Yeah, amazing, really. But, you know, that pilot season, when I was really hoping, you know, you know, I was an actor for hire. I was not a woman on a mission, right. you know. I needed a job. I had rent to pay. And, um, and I was really praying that something good with a quality piece would turn up. 
And, um, you know, so often the roles for women at that time certainly were, you know, we were in support of the man in some way. You were his wife, you were his girlfriend, mm -hmm. you were his secretary. Or you, were, you know, or it was women who didn't like each other. You know, there were not an abundance of good uh, uh, role model, female roles. And when this script arrived, it just got my attention because there were not just one, but two women mm -hmm. at the head of it. They were women who liked each other, and they were women who weren't actually women. They were angels. Yeah. And, um, and I remember going in to read for it, and my agent had said, now this is an American role. He said, don't be going in there with an Irish accent. <laughs> uh, he said, because what had happened a few times when I'd gone out in auditions, apart from the Irish spring moment, <laughs> there were other things that said, you would be an interesting alternative choice but uh. we're going to go with an American. So he said to go in with an American accent and don't reveal that you're Irish. And so I was in there and I'm talking <laughs> with my American accent. And then one of the producers said, but now wait a minute. Do I remember reading that you are Irish? And you know, the minute I think about Ireland or start talking about Ireland, my accent just floods in <laughs> and I said, well, I am. And he said, that might be interesting. And of course, I'm thinking, oh, uh, here, here, it'll go. be interesting, but then they'll cast an American. But can I tell you, when I started doing one of those beautiful monologues, you know, Touched by an Angel, I always had this scene, we called it the angel revelation scene, mm -hmm. which, you know, the character was undercover for most of the episode. And then once the person would, would call out to God for help, I could then reveal that I was actually an angel sent by God and I was here to help. And I read that monologue with my Irish accent and the musicality of the accent really added something yeah. to, the, to the character. And I felt the character come into me as well. You know, I thought, oh, I hope they have the vision to, and, the, and the boldness to go with that. You know, because there's a tendency sometimes on television, if something's a hit, I think they just want to recreate that, you know, if, yeah. th if there's a certain look, let's, let's have everybody look that way, or if there's a certain sound, because they're not quite sure what it is that people are watching, and everybody wants a, a, a hit show, you know. So there was a boldness that CBS, I think, exhibited in bringing in uh, myself, and then casting Della Reese to be uh, my partner in, in well, crime. because you look so much alike. The two of you are so similar. We're, so, no, we're like, <laughs> in, it's really the most, you know, you couldn't have seen that on paper, right. that this would have been, you know, such a beautiful marriage of, of spirits. And yet, what a lasting gift for me yeah. Della Reese has been. I mean, being a believer and being untouched by an angel and bringing a message of God's love every week to millions of people was such a privilege and a blessing for me. And the lasting blessing for me has been that Della Reese came into my life. Yeah. Because you know, Della's daughter died when we were shooting Touched by an Angel, mm -hmm. her only daughter. And my mother, of course, had died when I was a little girl. And Della took me in her arms and she said to me, you know, baby, I always knew that God brought me into your life because you needed a mother. She said, I just hadn't realized that he was bringing you into my life because I was going to need a baby girl. She said, will you be my baby? And I said, yes. And she said, then I am your mama. And so I, you know, I have a mother. It was, it, my mom was taken away and then my mother was restored. And I have a mother in Della Reese and to this day, we see each other, we love on each other. She's been such a mentor to me and a great support in my life and for oh, my family. Wonderful. And as I travel uh, the country and continue to meet people, Touch by an Angel still plays on reruns mm -hmm. and it's still um, impacting people. You know, there's a timelessness, I think, to those stories and it, f and it fed a need in people, you know. I think we're starving. Yeah. You know, I really think that we are starving for God, where you can't drive down any boulevard and you're not bombarded with all the things you need to complete your life. If you don't buy this, you're not going to be happy. If you don't mm -hmm. have this, you're not worthy. If you, you know, it's just like you're the overstimulus of things just to remind you 
you know, of all the things you think you need, and yet the truth is, you know, all we need is a relationship with God, and um, and and it begins in here, and then everything changes. Well, they often say lightning doesn't strike twice, but you have a phenomenal success with something people don't think is going to work, touched by an angel, and then we zip ahead a bunch of years, and the Bible miniseries. I'm sure on paper people said, this is never going to work. People aren't going to give you that attention. And now you can sit back and say, what, close to a billion people have seen it? I know, <laughs> I mean, it is. It's phenomenal. I know. It's phenomenal. It is. It's a God thing, you know. I mean, listen, when I heard the whisper in my heart to do the Bible series, um, and I talked it out with my husband, Mark Burnett, I said, you know, this might sound crazy, but I feel that God has placed on my heart that we should bring the Bible to television. And and Mark said, what do you mean, the Bible, the whole Bible? <laughs> and I said, yeah, the Bible, and bring it as a series to TV. It's never been done before. Individual uh, stories had been told, and some of them very well, but nobody had attempted, um, you know, the, the series from Genesis to Revelation. And so we prayed on it together as a couple, and we, we shook hands and we decided that we would do it, and we would do it together. And, um, and it's been a great, um, it was a great partnership. You know, my, my husband really brings the hammer, <laughs> and I bring the heart, and it required both. It couldn't have happened without the dynamic that each of us brought. And, um, uh, you know, I think that many people thought we were collectively insane, but yeah, <laughs> but it's a uh, hundred million people showed up in this country yeah. alone, and absolutely, it has it has just rippled uh, around the world, and um, and has been just extraordinary uh, that the people spoke, you know, and they spoke so loudly. And while we were in uh, Morocco filming, uh, we had an editor with us at all times, which was uh, uh, great, uh, because it gave us an opportunity to see the footage. Uh, right. and we would put rough assemblies together, and we would actually have screenings, and we would invite everybody to come, you know, whether you were the cleaning person or the star. It was like, we're doing these screenings, and why doesn't everybody come in? Because it gave the whole cast and crew an opportunity to see what they were part of, yeah. and how, when it all came together, it was better than anybody could have even dreamed that it might have been. And and so it raised the bar for everybody. I think when you start seeing how good it is, everybody's performance, you know, raises and it's good for morale and so on. And it was at one of these screenings as the Jesus narrative began to unfold, I turned to Mark and said, Ah, oh, don't you wish we'd been making a film? Because this is just to see <laughs> it on the big screen was epic. And so there and then we decided that that's what we would do, that even though we had the series, which was the grand narrative of the whole Bible, we would release the Jesus portion of the series with additional footage, re-edited to create a standalone cinematic experience, and, and thus was born the film Son of God. And to think, you were saying earlier about how Hollywood has the tendency to try and replicate what they think is successful. And yet what we often find out is it's the things that aren't the replications are the true successes. Yes. And so, yes, you could have tried to remake a touch by, the, touch by an Angel. You could have tried to remake any myriad of things. But by doing the Bible, something no one would have expected, lightning strikes there, too. Absolutely. Well, you know, and I think there was certainly a boldness required, you know, um, to step out and to step out in faith uh -huh. also. Because, you know, in my business, you certainly know that there's getting the idea, then there's acting on the idea, you know, taking action and making it happen, uh, which in and of itself is, you know, is, is, it's hard work to get anything done, you know, to get anything made. Um, and then, you know, a lot of energy and uh, creativity needed in how, how to reach people and how to step out there in a secular world, mm -hmm. you know, on a history channel cable channel <laughs> and you know it, uh, you know and how 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 you know how are we going to present it um, to the world and you know I know at one point there were campaigns they were thinking well can we present it as you know an action you know <laughs> drama you know and I'm just sitting back there smiling going and 
and God, you yeah. know, He's and so God, involved. you know, it's like it's <laughs> the Bible, you know, and God, and uh, and then I think finally everybody, you know, it's it's it unfolded absolutely as it as it should have done. It was just it been it's been just amazing. And one can joke it was so successful. There should be a sequel to the Bible. There should. And then I find out, actually, there is. You guys are going to do AD. Yes, we are. We're, we're really excited about that. Um, NBC uh, have bought AD, so it's going to be on network television. <laughs> um, it, um, it will reset the story around the crucifixion of Jesus and follow the, the tension and the fear and the danger of the disciples in the aftermath of Jesus' death. And um, and so it's you know essentially will be the book of Acts. Yeah. Um, we have a twelve-hour order. Uh, <laughs> we're going to be filming that later this year, uh, with the hopes that that will be on NBC fall of two thousand fifteen. So we had the Bible series two thousand thirteen. We have the feature film about the life of Jesus two thousand fourteen, and we will have AD. Um, uh, the series on NBC 2015. Well, we look forward to whatever else comes out of your mind on all of this, and thank you so much for all you've given us over the years. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Roma Downey.